My name is Matthew Baldoff, and I'm the Dungeon Master for Bold Wolf Gaming's homebrew D&D stream, Winds of Arania, which is premiering October 23rd on Twitch. This campaign has been going on for over a year, and we have more than 30 sessions already complete. Though we've come to a nice breaking point in the campaign, this video will help you catch up on the more important points of our story so far. If you want a more detailed accounting of the first two acts, you can check out the Road So Far link below, or in the About section if you're watching this on Twitch, where I've tried to boil the first two acts into bullet points. If you really like reading, you can check all of the recaps for our first 37 sessions and follow along with the story. Um, and that is also where you'll be able to see all of our recaps going forward if you miss any episodes. And that link is below as well, and in the About section on Twitch. So for now, here's a brief overview of the story of Winds of Arania. When our story began, Malcolm, Mira, Zuko, and Octavia, and a small host of other characters, woke up on the airship vestige with no memory of who they were or why they were there. <clears throat> they were only able to learn a few things besides their names before the airship was attacked by rocks and crashed in a remote part of Palhas province. They were smugglers by trade, currently on a mission to bring a strange ancient stone tablet to the premier thieves' guild of the region. There was a stowaway on board, and one of them was not part of the ship's regular complement. They later discovered that the man that they thought was Emmett was actually named Jesper Forsleg, a member of some strange cult and most likely the man re uh, responsible for erasing their memories. They shot him and left him for dead. Unfortunately, that was not the end of him. Act 1 was making their way from the backwoods town of uh, White Bluff to Palha City on foot, along the way making new friends, powerful allies, and a couple lovers as well. All the while, they were trying to learn what had happened to them and why as well as trying to stay a step ahead of the strange cult that Jesper was a part of. They learned that the gods were aware of some pending disaster that the forlorn smugglers would be responsible for stopping, and were rooting for them in their own way. Meanwhile, uncomfortable pieces of their personal history began to fall into place. Octavia was kidnapped by none other than Jesper, who had risen from the dead after being killed by Malcolm. The party then found Alaric, a farmer turned assassin bent on revenge for his dead wife, who seemed to be directed into their path by the gods to replace Octavia. In Act 2, the party finally arrived in Palaha City and begrudgingly handed over the strange artifact that may have been the cause of all their troubles. But they were directed by an old friend in the guild, Sebastian Braun, to where they might be able to recover their memories. A short time later, they were abducted by agents of a secret order that warned them they had now handed three of these artifacts to the, the very same cult they were trying to avoid. The four members of the party were the only ones who could access the fourth tablet, and if they did, it would mean the end of the world as they knew it. After they recovered their memories, they became aware of how they had been manipulated up to that point. All of them had been tricked into retrieving the first few tablets before they knew what it was. Recognizing the third tablet when they went to pick it up, is what most likely caused Jesper to erase their memories. They saved yet another small town from certain doom and took on the name The Regulators before returning to the life of crime. Alaric was contacted by an unknown entity and offered substantial power for his quest of vengeance, not realizing he was selling his soul to the demon god Orcus, who was also the patron of the very woman he was hunting down. After assassinating Empress Alexandra Nordheim, to seal the deal, he realized he may have made a horrible mistake. While the party was on a quest to resurrect their friend Sebastian after he fell in a deadly competition, Alaric left to pursue his target so that his sacrifice was not in vain, and he didn't endanger the rest of the party. The party commissioned a new airship and returned to one of the towns from their initial trek uh, to pick up Argette, a woman Malcolm became enamored with and had gotten pregnant on their first time through. They realized that whatever tied them to this entity the cult was trying to bring to power was hereditary, and that put Arget and his unborn child in danger. They found the town besieged by demons, led by a demigod named Diabolus. It seemed that while the righteous gods were actively on their side, the evil gods were backing this entity named Mantis, which history seemed to make no mention of. Mira, a champion of the god Ivor, was besieged by the god himself, to help the cult of Mantis gain the last tablet in his name, and she flatly refused. He swore that he would see her killed by his other champions, the people she once saw as peers. After saving Arget, they were approached by Ardun, one of the agents that had warned them to stay clear of the last piece of the tablet. 
He explained that when Mantis was last in power, a pantheon of gods known as the Fira chose four champions to defeat him and seal him away in his realm. Malcolm, Mira, Zuko, and Alaric were the heirs of that legacy. The only ones who could retrieve the tablets from their current locations, and the only ones who could stop Mantis if he returned. But if any of them died, the cult could get to the next heir in line before they knew what recovering the tablet would mean. However, while he was unable to recover the first three tablets from the cult, he had a place that the last piece could be taken and never touched again by heirs like themselves or anyone else. They followed Ardun to the castle of Clismir the Undying, one of Malcolm's ancestors, to retrieve the last tablet. When they arrived, they found Alaric, who had made another deal with Orcus. In exchange for resurrecting his wife, Orcus wanted Alaric to get the last tablet piece and kill the other heirs. He regretfully engaged in combat with his former friends and allies, and was ultimately killed. Before he passed, Malcolm gave him a powerful religious artifact that cleared his soul of his debt to Orcus and allowed him to meet his wife in the afterlife. They also discovered the remains of Octavia and witnessed her last moments, bravely giving her life rather than giving in to Jesper's demands. When they returned to Palhas City, and Ardun was prepared to take the tablet to its final resting place, the cult made one last attempt at stealing it. They engaged in a violent tug of war over the tablet, with Dardoon sacrificing himself and his own fireball to help. In the end, the regulators were triumphant, Jesper was killed for good this time, and the tablet was sealed away, ending the threat of Mantis forever. As Act 3 begins, the regulators have a chance to breathe and bury their dead. This, but the story isn't over. Orcus still has physical form on the mortal realm, and is now free to pursue his own goals over that of his master, who will never return. The throne of the Iranian Empire is occupied by a man who served Mantis's cause. The church that served as a front for the cult still has political power in more than half the countries on the continent. And Mira has come face to face with the first huntsman to take on Ivor's bounty on her head. There's much more to come. Winds of Irania premieres on October 23rd at 7pm Eastern Standard Time on Bold Wolf Gaming's Twitch stream. Hope to see you there.